my artistic friends, I'm artist Susan Jenkins and I'm here in my studio today bringing you something I'm calling You Ask For It. I've been getting so many requests for um, a, a lesson on how I accomplish something that I often call punching up color. How do you like that graphic? That's a really bad hand I did, <laughs> but it was fun. Anyway, so this is for you and I am so thankful because I am a color freak and it seems to come a little naturally for me. However, there are other things that don't come naturally for me. So uh, I'm going to try to share with you uh, my reasoning and my methods behind why I choose certain colors that I do and uh, make the impact of color more explosive and uh, beautiful in art. And first, before we can learn how to do this in our paintings, it's important that we learn a little bit more about color in general. So we're gonna be going through a little lesson. It won't be tedious, it's gonna be fun, and I think you're gonna love it on how color works and why we would choose certain colors that work in harmony in a, in a painting. Then I'm gonna go through some of my pieces where I have done this, enhanced the color, and uh, share my reasoning behind that. Then last, and probably the most fun part, is we're gonna do a painting together, and I will go through um, why I'm choosing colors and um, the reasoning behind uh, those selections. So I hope you enjoy it. We're gonna have a lot of fun, and let's do it. Punching up color. <laughs> so to begin with, in learning about how to uh, enhance your color and punch it up in your artwork, the basic handy dandy little pocket color wheel, I like this little one right here, um, is a great tool for learning. Once you have um, studied it and learned from it, you don't have to always refer back to this, but it is crucial to learn about the relationships between colors in uh, creating good paintings. So at first you can look at this and go, well, this is really confusing. Look at this thing spins around, what is that? And then if you look at all the information on the back, it's like, whoa, what is all of that? But I'm gonna go through this and explain it. And I wanted to share with you something that was, wow, what a blessing. Sometimes I'm just like, God, thanks so much for that little gift right there. Because I was thinking I want to arrange my pastels in a way that um, mimics the color wheel. And I was thinking, what do I have in my house? A big plate, uh, how can I do that? And lo and behold, I opened my cabinet and forgot, ta-da. I have this, uh, basically it's a Publix container that was an appetizer tray that I had saved in case I do any kind of event. Um, but I usually don't because I'm usually painting. I don't have time for parties. <laughs> but anyway, um, I know you guys can relate. So how perfect is this? So I just cut out a few little paper towels in here. And this is for the purpose of explaining this lesson. But I also really like this. It's really, really cool. So first and foremost, before I go into this, I'm just going to kind of show you very quickly um, an easy way to understand the relationships between colors. Pardon that shadow there. And I'm just holding my camera as I do this. Um, but first I'm going to just do the three primary colors, okay? So um, most of you probably already know that. We've got blue, we've got red, and we've got yellow. And if you've done any work in any other type of medium, watercolor, acrylic, or oil, you know that Though, and you've probably learned just even from grade school that those colors make really every color. It's just fascinating. And, um, but what is, uh, is neat is that you can do another little triangle um, to uh, take your color wheel even further. Notice how it looks like a Jewish star. That might help you to remember it, okay? So you're going to do a, a, a right side up triangle and upside down triangle. And then over here, we're going to do the colors that combine with this. It'd be easier if I used the actual colors um, instead of a pencil. Um, blue and red make purple. Uh, blue and yellow make green. Okay, and red and yellow make orange. Okay, of course, most of you, it's like, oh, come on, Susan, that is like so basic. Yes, but knowing where these are on the color wheel is what's going to help you understand the relationships between colors and whether they are cool or warm. Okay, so that's why I made this little color wheel tray here. Um, and that is what's going to help us in knowing which colors to use. We can't just take any bold color and use in a painting to punch up color. It has to be one that suits the, um, there are actually laws in um, how art works and how nature works. And if you go too far beyond that, your painting is going to look amateurish and, um, and just not correct. 
So that's why I'm gonna go through this color wheel with you in actual pastels, very cool. All right, so now we have a bird's eye view of our color wheel that I have strategically placed on top of my uh, palette of colors I've arranged to mimic the color wheel. And again, this is going to be very important in learning how to use these to enhance the color in your paintings. Now, again, I have done these, um, not they're not quite in the same order here. This one had the, the blue up top, but it's just turned a little bit here. So we've got our yellow, our primary colors, yellow, blue, and red in the triangle, okay? And then the ones in between that, that would make the upside down triangle, we've got the, what, what makes uh, orange, yellow and red? What makes purple, blue and red? What makes green, blue and yellow? Okay, so all of those colors are in, be in the in-between sections. Isn't that amazing how this tray just happened to work out perfectly? Wow, very cool. Now, in understanding, now I've gone over this in another video, the difference between warm and cool colors, but I am going over it again here because it's the, one of the most important things with learning how to punch up your color in your paintings is knowing where and when to use a certain bright or bold color. Now I'm gonna explain warm and cool again very quickly. Now, if you notice in this color wheel, if I was to take it and just break it in half like this, all right, we're going to have our cool colors are going to be on this side, okay? Our blues, our purples, and our greens in general, okay? Our warm colors are going to be on this side, our reds and our yellows, okay? Now, this is just the basic um, description of warm and cool, but each color can lean more towards warm or cool based on where it is on the color wheel. Um, let's start, for example, um, well, we'll start with the, the reds here, all right? So if we've got a red that's just a red red, this one's probably closer to just a red red, okay? Um, although they have a little bit of uh, blue in them too that lean more this way. Um, the red reds are going to be more like right in the middle, but as a red gets a little bit more blue in it, it's going to get a little bit of a cooler red, okay? Notice how these are closer, they're going this direction to the cool side. So if they're moving in this direction, they're going to be cooler reds, okay? And um, if they're moving in this direction, they're going to be warmer reds, all right? Getting more towards the orangey. They're getting more yellow in them. These are getting more blue in them. These are getting more yellow in them. Now the same thing with the purples. We could have just a purple purple, but if it's leaning a little bit more this way, it's going to be a warmer purple versus a cooler purple, okay? Cooler's going towards the blue. Now we can do the same thing with the blue. We've got the blue here, and if a blue is leaning more towards the purple side, it's going to be a warmer blue. If it leans more towards this side, it's going to be a cooler blue, okay? So we're, we're kind of getting the idea. Each one kind of works the same way. If you've got the greens here, now they're sitting right next to the yellows, okay? So they're right at this line here. So if you've got greens that are more towards the yellow, they're going to be more of a warm green. If you've got them kind of in between the uh, yellow and the green, these would be cooler greens, okay? Um, because they do have a bit of blue in them, all right? So uh, that's basically, and the same thing applies for the yellows, that's basically how you would know the difference between warm and cool colors. And uh, again, it's very, very crucial in knowing how to punch up color. So now I'm gonna go over a little bit more about the color wheel, and this should be educational and fun. Now let's talk about the color wheel. I think sometimes we don't even realize what a wealth of information we have at our fingertips with just a simple pocket color wheel. Um, again, we've got our colors, our, our primary colors in the triangle, and then we've got our secondary colors in the upside down triangle, okay? So um, I might not have this turned exactly right, but you get the idea. Now this right here is an amazing little tool um, that works really well for acrylic and oil and, and uh, watercolor painting um, with color mixing. Now we don't get as much of an ability to do color mixing with pastels, but we do to a degree. Um, we can do a little bit of blending. I've talked a little bit about my handy dandy pipe foam insulation blending tool that I learned from Karen Margulis. I actually also um, 
talked to another artist, a newfound artist friend, who said it works just as well with a pool noodle. So if you don't feel like going out to the hardware store, but you have a pool noodle in your pool, that should work for blending. Um, but we typically don't blend a whole lot in pastel paintings. But anyway, this is still a very useful tool um, for just learning how color works in general. So um, for example, I've got them lined up, this blue with the blue right now, but if you added yellow to blue, you're going to get green. If you add red to blue, you're going to get purple. Um, so that's how all these three work. They work going around every single color here. Um, now, another one that's um, helpful is um, they've got the red, the yellow, the blue. Then they've got what happens if you add white to a color. It's going to lighten it, obviously. You add black, it's going to darken it. So that is just a, a really neat um, tool that is on the color wheel. This is another one. Some people may not have even known it's in here. Value. That's upside down. Let me go right side up. Value is what I talk about all the time. So you have a little basic value scale here, okay? So you can kind of get an idea of what value is a color, okay? So if we were just looking at this orange, oh, sorry for that cut on my finger, that's terrible. <laughs> um, uh, we would scroll this little value thing around to see what value it is. Now that's too dark for it. Boy, I got cuts. That's not a cut, that's pastels. Anyway, um, you scroll it around here to find what value it is. Now, if we, we can see that's not, that light, it's not that light. We're getting closer. It's gonna be somewhere more, maybe kind of in here somewhere. So isn't that neat that we've got a little value scale right there? All right, now I'm gonna um, read a couple of these little definitions for you because this is also important to know. Uh, we talked about our primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. Okay, nothing, oh, there's my doggy. Nothing can be mixed. Um, other colors cannot mix to make that. That's why they're called primary. They just, that's what they are. It's the way God made them. You can't mix to get them. Um, secondary colors are what we said. You mix two of the primaries together. Tertiary colors are mixing one primary and one secondary, okay? So it'd be like mixing a blue and an orange, okay? So that would be a tertiary color or intermediate color. Aggressive colors are warm colors. Receding colors are cool. We talked about that in multiple videos. Warm colors come forward in a scene. Cool colors recede. You want to use those cool colors in the distance. Um, now again, over here, we've got more definitions. Hue is just another name for color. Tint is color plus white. Tone is color plus gray. Shade is color plus black. Uh, key color is a dominant color in a color scheme um, or mixture. Neutral gay. Uh, anyway, there's a ton of these. And here's the most important one I talk about all the time. Value, like we said, the lightness or darkness of a color. Now I'm going to flip this over and we're going to talk about the back side very quickly. All right, now on the back side, we have more useful information. It's just awesome. But if you didn't know what it, uh, all this meant, you could, like I said, get intimidated by it perhaps. Um, but it's nothing's all that hard. This right here um, is a great little tool for you to learn how to choose a color palette in your painting. Some people are like, how do you choose your color palette? And um, a lot of it I do by simply looking at my reference photo or where I happen to be on location painting. And um, the more you do it, the more this just comes naturally, okay? So a um, complementary colors we've talked about are just opposites on the color wheel. And that's why I've talked a lot about how it's very, very beneficial in doing a painting. If you're gonna do an underpainting, um, to put down a complementary color underneath. So if your scene is gonna have a lot of trees and maybe water, um, those are cool colors. You would put down a complementary underpainting, the ones that are directly across from it, as an underpainting. And it's just gonna make these colors pop even more. So that's a little bit about how to punch up color right there. Um, and then also, um, you have this uh, that shows you how to do what's called a triad or a triad in colors. You notice the little triangle. This is basically, once again, back to the primary colors, but you can turn this little thing. I've got this tape down. Let me try not to turn the actual um, background as well. You can turn this little thing to any triad that you want, okay? So you could do a triad of this purple, this green, and this rusty orange color, okay? Now, the other one on here is called a tetrad. A tetrad is the more like a rectangle. So it's allowing you to see four colors that would be harmonious in a painting together. So again, that's incredibly useful information. But I'm gonna go again and look at some of these little teeny weeny letters here and just quickly go over a couple of these. Monochromatic simply means using any shade or tint of one color in a painting. So it would be like a lot of times you might see where people do like a, a sepia uh, tone painting. 
um, where all of the colors are in this family, okay? So it's the same color, um, just with the different um, hues and tints and, I'm sorry, um, values uh, of that color. And then the next one over here is analogous color, using any shade or tint or tones of colors that lie adjacent to each other on the wheel. So it's just analogous, they're, they're close to each other, okay? So we would be doing a painting that has kind of like these all within the painting, all right? And achromatic is basically what it sounds like. It's no color, okay? It means without color, a colorless scheme. Um, color and light, this is interesting. Subdued light, like let's say it's a, a candlelit um, painting or reference photo or something at night where there's just a few uh, a little light source, is the colors that are near the light are going to be the boldest, okay? They're going to have more intensity than um, the dark areas. The dark areas are going to have less intensity. The warm areas are going to have more intensity. That's kind of easy, really. Color and distance. I talk about this one all the time. Of course, we know that colors in the distance tend to black out. That's kind of a, um, a confusing term. Blackout means to lose the black is what they mean. You tend to um, get paler and weaker in color when you go to the distance. Not adding more black, losing more black. Consequently, of course, lighter values of color should be employed for greater emphasis in the background, okay? So that creates distance when color is lighter and, and more pale in the distance. It's not punched up color in the distance, okay? Um, over here, we've got a couple more complementary colors we've already talked about. Split combinations is using one color. Uh, choosing one color and using the color on each side of its complement on the color wheel. Anyway, on and on and on it goes, and this just describes some of the ones that I already talked about in the middle here. Okay, so um, there is our lesson that I thought would be quick on the color wheel, but it is important to get to know, be, let the color wheel be your friend. <laughs> one other point in, uh, before we go on to talking about punching up color and how to accomplish it, is simply in the arrangement that I've made here on my little makeshift color wheel, with pastels is if you notice I have them in order of value I did this very quickly so it's not perfect but in general from light to dark into the center the lighter values are on the outside moving into the darker values okay in the center all right now that is also incredibly important when punching up color you don't want to get the value wrong you can get the color um, different but you don't want to get the value wrong and uh, so that is one of the first lessons in punching up color is use the correct value. The second lesson is what we talked about before. Use the correct temperature. So temperature would be the second is make sure if it's something in a shadowy area, um, it's going to be cooler. You can punch that color up to something bolder than is in the area, but have it the correct value and have it the correct temperature. Okay. So that's just two points uh, for our first beginning exploration and punching up color. Now these in the middle, just on a side note, I put in my more neutral colors. Neutral colors are ones that look kind of dead and um, lifeless. Uh, they just don't have a lot of color. Like for example, take this orange compared to that. You could totally see how much more dead that color is. So when you're punching up color, you obviously wouldn't use these, although you're going to have to use some neutrals in your scene or your painting's gonna look tacky. <laughs> so. Three lessons in punching up color so far is use the correct value, two, use the correct temperature, and three, don't use all bold colors. You know, have some neutrals in your scene as well. So use, you punch up your color sparingly. All right, now let's go on to talking about how to uh, implement this into your artwork. Now, on to some examples of how I have actually punched up color in some of my previous artwork. This uh, painting is actually a great example because you notice in the photo on the left that I got from Paint My Photo is uh, very dull and gray. It's a beautiful photograph, which is why I chose it, um, but it doesn't have much um, color to speak of other than some 
uh, gray neutral tones. So what I did in this case was I, and some of the things we've already talked about, is I have actually not strayed away too much from value, uh, even though the color seems very bold and rich. And I'm going to show you that right now by converting this to black and white. I did, however, make the, um, the clouds darker. I wanted it to look a little bit more ominous like a storm. So uh, let's look at the black and white, and I'll show you what I mean. Now, in this converted uh, to black and white um, example, you can see that even though the color was very punched up in the painting, the values are pretty close. Again, I did my clouds a little darker and more ominous on purpose, um, and the foreground uh, in the right side where the water's washing up is a little bit darker, uh, but kind of reflects the sky. So, in general, the values are pretty close. So that's exactly um, the lesson that I'm trying to get across is that if you get your values right and you get your temperatures right, I'm going to talk about that too, then you can actually uh, punch up the color with um, similar values. Now for the second part of how to punch up color, we're going to talk about color temperature. I've zoomed in on the reference photo a little bit and you can see again that uh, there is some color in this and it's, uh, it's really pretty, but um, in order to punch it up, I'm going to show you uh, by oversaturating this photograph uh, to get a good idea of the color temperature. All right, now look at that. I've basically just increased the saturation in Photoshop, but there's lots of little photo editing um, tools that you can use to do the same thing. And like I said before, the, the more you do this, the more you just see it with your eyes instead of having to convert it in a photo program. So you can see now that uh, where those uh, purples and magentas are in the sky, you can also see how the sand uh, is warmer because, of course, like I mentioned before, you want to follow what is that item. Sand is typically warm, so in the foreground, that sand is going to have a warmer tone. So again, this is about following correct color temperature, and a tip for how to do that is to increase the saturation until you get to where you can do it automatically with your own eyes. Now, here are just a few other examples of paintings that I've done where I've punched up the color. The first two I have side by side, so you can just get an idea. Um, and uh, this one of the beach scene actually was quite dull, but I know that at night, beaches are typically, the sand is cooler. So I punched that up by making it more of that beautiful um, blue color. And uh, again, these are just some examples. And now we're gonna actually go on and do a painting, and I'll talk through the process of punching up color. I wanted to make a quick point also about uh, the color in this particular painting I did. I think I make a comment later to uh, be sure not to punch up color in the background. Uh, you don't want to overdo it, but in cases like this, you can see you actually can do that as long as you're following the, the rules that I spoke of before, using the correct value and the correct color temperature. Notice those mountains look really purple and the field in the background is really punched up turquoise or teal. And, uh, and it works here because it is uh, correct value and correct temperature. Just wanted to make that point. Now we can paint. Now here is my reference photo that I chose from the Paint My Photo website. I've uh, mentioned that quite a few times. I believe it's pmp-art.com. You can find some great reference photos to work from. And I purposely chose a photo that was a little more dull in color. Uh, just to be able to um, punch up color like is the point of this video. So this has, um, you know, it has some color, but nothing is very vibrant or bold. And uh, I wanted to be able to uh, demonstrate how to increase the intensity of the color in a scene such as this. Now the first thing I want to do in analyzing this photo is to determine the light source. Where is my light? And as I can see pretty easily, it's coming from the upper left-hand side. I can look at that darkest dark in the whole reference photo, which is the tree, and I can see that the left side of the tree is lighter than the right side of the tree. That gives me a great indication of the light source. And so I'm going to judge that or use that as a measurement um, in how to approach my painting as to where the, 
the lighter places in, in value are in the grasses and where the cooler shadows are going to be. You notice those uh, grasses growing to the left side about midway up. Those have a, a pretty uh, distinct shadow on this front side to them. So they're going to be darker and cooler in value because it's more of a shadow and uh, it's darker also on the side of the grasses in, immediately in the foreground to the right side. So that are those are just a few things that I notice in um, beginning to approach how I'm going to choose color and value for this scene. Now after determining the light source I'm going to evaluate the values and uh, a good way to do that is to convert your photo to black and white. After you've done it a while you don't need to do that but it's a great way to get used to this and so this is a really easy way for me to see the values so now without further ado I'm going to do a value study I'm gonna speed it up a bit uh, because I want to get to the part more about color than a value study is the time when I start uh, choosing a direction to go with this, okay? It, the, the value study that I got underneath um, is not all that important to choosing my color palette right now. It was just basically like a, a template for me to get started. And so now I have to get my idea of, okay, where do I want to head with a color palette? And so this is a um, actually a lesson more than just uh, punching up color, it's also on you basically just choosing your color palette. A lot of times I will start with the sky. Now, when I was first starting out as an artist, I would paint this color, okay? I'd be like, oh, it's blue. Let me look down here. Let me see. Okay, is this kind of in here? You know, let's see. And, um, uh, and I would do it basically just on trying to match colors, okay? And when you get a little bit more um, adventurous and knowledgeable with art uh, and experienced, you will learn that you can set the mood of your color palette as long as you follow the same values. Again, like, um, like we noticed on our color wheel, uh, I could choose all uh, analogous colors right here. I could do the whole thing uh, working in in like this this area and I've done that in another one of my lessons I took the same black and white photo and I did analogous color with a blue one with a green I think one with a red and one with a yellow orange something like that so you can totally change the color of what's in the scene as long as you follow the rules correctly with value and with with warmth um, and coolness so now I'm going to decide, all right, and I'm doing this live right here, or not live, but recorded when you see it. I'm just going to look at this right now and pick a color. I haven't predetermined this. I think I want a lavender sky, okay? And the reason I'm doing that is because this looks like it's late evening or very early morning. It's still kind of foggy and misty. And uh, if I chose an orange sky or a red or a pink sky, it would indicate that there was more sunlight somewhere and this looks more like it's cloudy there's not a lot of sun um, so I'm gonna go more with those cooler tones um, but I don't want so much blue in it that is like here so I'm gonna go with some lavenders maybe and and I've spoken about this before 
Typically, your darker values in a sky are up in the upper horizon, okay? Uh, I think it's called the aurora. It's up higher in the sky, something like that. Sounds good anyway. <laughs> and then gradually, your skies almost always, not always, but almost always get lighter as you get down to the horizon line. Okay, so I'm going to work with darker, or not darker, um, purple values that are darker than down here. And I think I'm going to gradiate it down to more bluer, cooler tones down here, okay? Now, what's gonna happen, is you can already kind of see this happening, the same thing's gonna happen in the reflection of the water. You notice how this looks a little darker up here? Well, look how that is so beautifully reflected in the water. We've got that same darker, if I do the lavenders up here, I'm gonna do the lavenders down here. What is that? More pastels on my fingers. <laughs> and um, then these lighter colors of the sky here, are reflected here and reflections basically work like a mirror okay so if you took this um, here and just flopped it down here bloop that's gonna be it's gonna follow the same rules whoops wrong reference picture okay so basically um, that's how I'm gonna approach the sky and then I'm going to let that be my my guide as to how I work the rest of the painting with those cooler values all right, so I found a, a lavender that I like. It's not too dark and not too light, and I think it will make a nice um, uh, value in the upper part of the sky. A little dark, but that's okay. I can lighten it up. Actually, I like that. All right, now if you notice, it does get lighter on this side of the sky, so I'm gonna accentuate that. And look at how yummy that beautiful underpainting is showing through. That just, if, if this was a, um, a white piece of paper, it wouldn't have nearly the same effect. Or if this was, if I had toned this all blue, um, this uh, color behind it just gives such a richness. All right, so now I've got that lavender. Now I'm choosing some blues. I'm, I'm resisting using Terry Ludwig's right now. Sometimes you just have to work with what you have, but it's because Terry Ludwig's are so, um, they fill up the tooth so quickly. They're so soft and yummy um, that they fill up the tooth. Now, I happen to like this um, shade. It's it's like a primrose. That's just, it's, it's in between a blue and a purple. It's so gorgeous. So I'm gonna show that color there in comparison with this lavender. You see how the lavender is warmer and this is cooler? This is a great color for distant mountains if you have a lighter sky. All right, so I, I'm just gonna play around with that color in here. And sometimes that's all I'm doing is I'm just playing. <laughs> but I'm going to give this side of it a little bit more of the coolness. It's a little dark. And blend it a little. See how we, we can blend a little bit. And I do think I am going to take my, um, my pipe foam insulation and blend the sky a little bit just so I don't have so much of that showing through. All right. So now I need a much lighter value um, for down at the... Um, horizon line here and I'm examining what I have on my palette here this is lighter but it might be too much lighter okay see so here we go that's getting lighter now what I'm gonna do is get this in above these mountains and I'm still keeping a fairly light touch sometimes I look for a flat spot okay that's better we've got some lighter back in here behind these trees and I'll carve this tree out later Again, I'm just getting my values in. But you can see how, I mean, I wouldn't say I've punched up color yet, but I have enhanced the color definitely by not just making this a totally gray sky, okay? Um, and I could have done the same thing if I had chosen pinks or, or yellowy colors, all right? So dark down to light, all right? So my color's already a little bit lively there, which is nice. Put more of this down in here. Maybe a little bit more of this purple in here. And um, when I go to carve out the trees, I will use these darker values to carve out the trees. Usually uh, tr sky holes and trees um, look better if they're just a hint of a value darker rather than lighter. So they don't look like popcorn in the trees, you know. <laughs> All right. I think I'll blend a little bit of this down in here. So I'm just trying to create a sense of harmony. And again, a little blending. I might even get a little bit darker with the lavender up there. Check this. That's close to the center. That's a little lighter than that, actually. And this one is darker, but it may be too dark. But I'm going to put just a tad right here, just for interest in the sky. 
and then I'll blend it a little bit more with the lighter lavender. Yeah, see that already created some interest. Be a tad more over here. All right. Now, I already know these colors are going to be reflected in the water. So while I have these pastels out, that would be a really good idea. And again, this is some trees or uh, something growing across the water here. I'm going to go ahead and scumble in some of the water. And it is definitely darker down here. But see how I'm giving the same shape to the values in this. And um, also, while I'm just getting in basic colors right now, um, it's always a good idea when you're laying down your, your final marks to go in the direction of how the water is. Like right now, this water here is very flat. And so instead of making my lines like this, you want to accentuate the flatness of that water. Now I'm going to have some reflections of these grasses soon, but right now I'm just getting the values of these in. Oh yeah, I really like this color here. And sometimes certain areas you can drag down. Again, there's some water back in here, but it's kind of covered up by grasses. We'll kind of scumble that in in a minute. And back here, these are even going to be lighter values in this water back here, but uh, I'm just getting the basics in right now. Again, this is a little darker down here still. Again, directional strokes. I almost sometimes feel how it's supposed to go. It's flat, but sometimes I feel there's a little more of an angle here. And uh, another uh, really um, important thing to do as an artist is to be a student of nature. You're probably already doing that because as artists, you just, oh my gosh, you just, your eyes never stop. You're just looking at things all the time. Now there are some nice little highlights right here of these uh, of this water um, like maybe some light that's on this side that's coming down because the the lights over here and the same thing there's going to be some lights in the water through here okay and again I haven't incredibly punched up color yet but we'll get there to a degree I have because that's not the colors that you see in the scene it's just the same values okay all right looking good there. All right, now I think I am going to go ahead right now just to set the mood and blend in the sky at least a little. And notice I'm cleaning it off. I don't want to take that beautiful light sky and get any of that dark on there. All right, that's pretty good. And I'm working top to bottom, and again, wiping it off some. This is just going to soften it up some and, and make it recede. That's one of the main reasons for doing this with the sky. Sometimes I have skies where I let all the marks show, but often I will blend it some because you want to push it back. And prospectively, um, detail decreases as you go back. All right, I might even punch up that sky color a little bit more, but we have a general idea. We don't want the sky, you don't, your eye doesn't want to be drawn to that first. This, uh, what I can see is the most interest is this water, is this front area right in here. You're just gonna, I love a big wide opening of a river. It just draws your eye in, then lets your eye just flit around and play in the scene. Okay, so maybe, let me see about blending this water, maybe just a tad. Tad, did I say? <laughs> but this is going to give it a softness. All right, so we're getting a soft sky, some soft water, and I am going to add more marks to the water. Now I'm just turning this on its corner, kind of doing a little blending. All right, and again, this is going to get covered up with some grasses and things. 
All right, now I definitely need to get in and establish my darker values of the tree. Uh, I'm just going to blend it in a little bit right now to give it a base, and then I'm going to add more darks on top of that. Again, I'm just setting a mood here. I love the fogginess of this scene. I guess I'm going to end up blending the whole thing. Why not? <laughs> Don't always do this, but it just feels right for this foggy scene. And it also kind of helps me with my shapes. Again, I'm using just a little corner section. If I was to use the whole wide thing, I would kind of mess up my initial compositional drawing here. Okay, so now if you, if you squint your eyes, you're starting to see the values in this scene and that they're, uh, they're getting pretty close to correct, which is good. All right. Okay, when I squint my eyes, I can see that these values of the grasses, if you see in the reference photo, are darker than this, okay? So that's going to be established as I keep working. But I really already can see I'm loving this yummy purple right here. That's already giving me a direction to punching up the color, okay? I can uh, go ahead and see that I'm going to work with that purple, okay? Again, that's not really uh, the local color or the color that you see naturally on the scene, but I'm seeing that color. Again, I've got my... Um, my value correct, okay? It's not the same color, all right? It's not this dull, dead blue here. And I've got my temperature correct. It's a cooler blue, but uh, I mean, um, uh, a cooler temperature because it's water, but it's still a little warmer on the scale. <laughs> you see my palette here. It's not as close over here to these blues. It's moving a little more warmer in the purpley department. And that always looks good in the foreground. And, and actually, it reflects the sky, which is accurate as well, okay? So um, just, getting, uh, just getting that down already starts to help me um, punch up color a little bit. Blending, blending, blending. And again, don't want to overdo it. Sometimes it's nice just to have some of those marks and that, and that paper, the glow of the paper, uh, shining through. And again, you can do this underpainting color on any surface that you're working on. Um, say, for example, you're working on watercolor paper. I've done the videos to where I'll do an underpainting with watercolor and uh, let it dry. And often to keep your watercolor paper from curling, uh, put water on the back of it as well. Then it won't buckle and curl as much. And then after you do your underpainting with the watercolor paper, then you paint the clear gesso on it. You've got a gritty surface and bam, you've got something to work on. So I have various videos showing how to create underpaintings on various surfaces. Okay, so now I'm just going to paint a little bit and uh, give some commentary along the way.
Hmm. I thought I'd turn off my music here for a second um, to chime in. Notice how I'm seeing in the reference photo, I happen to know these grasses very well. They grow a lot in Florida on marshy areas and um, they have warm tones. They have, they're green grasses, but as some of them die, they're going to have more of that orangey tone, which is really a beautiful color. But um, to make this more interesting, noticed I held up um, the, um, the one that would be more natural to the scene. Okay. Um, this is still even a little bolder than the picture. Um, but if I was to use that, that'd be very dull as I'm making little marks here. By the way, this does not have a lot of tooth to it. I accidentally um, put this uh, underpainting on the wrong side of the mat board. That's the smooth side. This is the rough side. That's why you're seeing the graininess. And I'm not getting as many layers. So I'm being really ultra careful here. <laughs> but uh, my point was that instead of using that orangey color, I punched it up with more of a magenta. Okay, so that's not what I see in the scene, but I know it's already in the same, um, more leans more towards warm, whereas some of the tops of these grasses are more warm because the sun's hitting them, and uh, it's close to the right value. Okay, so we're already obeying the two rules that I talked about, which is uh, warmth and value. Now, these back here are getting a little on the cooler side because they're in the distance. So we're gonna have to, I already have those cooler back there. There's not a lot of uh, oranges and greens, but there's a little bit of green. I might do a really, you know, I already have something down there, but maybe a really cool green if I have the right, right shade of green. No, that's gonna be too, see this is too bold in color for back there. Colors recede, I mean colors pale out in the distance. That's not pale enough to put back here. That's too bold, okay? Um, so if I could find a, correct dull neutral green back there that would be better and i'm not seeing one in my palette that i have so i'll just do that later if i even do it kind of like the cooler colors back here okay so you've already seen i've punched up the purples they're the correct value and they're in the cooler area so we've got the right value and the right temperature so i added purple instead of adding black or gray or a deep blue which is you know more like what you see in here so uh, that purple was a lot more interesting um, this is more of the medium value. I had a darker value purple wherever that was um, So uh, this is a rich pretty purple too. And, and again a lot of times I just test colors Yeah, I like the darkness here. Of course my darkest darks are going to be right up here in the front Okay, so and you noticed I was um, Adding a little bit of those uh, shadows In the in the water or reflections I should say not shadows and again, they're going to do just like the sky. They mimic, if you were to turn it sideways, it's like a mirror image of each other. So wherever I have those darker marks, I'm just adding a few. And you just kind of pull down. See, I just added that one there. Pull it down. There's one there. Yes. And then I'm going to make the water flow over those marks. So that's what's actually going to give that illusion might add a little now that's too that's too dark a value back there it's just too dark that's going to look wrong okay so um let's see here i want to get a little bit more interest in these grasses and um maybe continue a little bit more with some of these warmer greens in here now i'm ready to add some greens all right since i added that beautiful uh, turquoisey color in here notice oh that's the lightest one i had a darker one i think um, that is, uh, just a gorge. Oh, it was this one. That is just a gorgeous, gorgeous color. See how I put that value down? That was too light. I could just instantly see that was too light. See how it stood out right there? Um, yeah, this is the better color here. And I think I'm gonna, because these are in the distance, you know, oh, that might be that. Yeah. Add a little bit more of the tops of these grasses back here. A little bit more of that deeper blue. Almost like you're creating just little layers of grasses and things. And again, I'm keeping these cooler greens more in this area. Might even need a little bit more darker value right at the bases there. Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and just continue with a little bit more of this rich 
turquoisey blue. And then I might add in some warmer greens to blend in with that. Okay, so you can already see we are definitely punching up color here. And I have kept a color palette that I'll have to show you when I can show you the color wheel. That is uh, definitely uh, harmonious. Now, if you notice, I'm not drawing individual grass blades. And I think that's what a lot of you guys, uh, including myself, like, is we like impressionism. When you start drawing individual, every little thing, um, we lose that, just the beautiful looseness of art. And it becomes, uh, it looks more like art when you're loose instead of a, a photograph. Um, so I'm throwing in a little bit of this, again, because you want to keep some harmony in your painting, even though I might throw in some warmer greens down here at the bottom as well. I'll intensify that water soon, but for now, just getting more of these richer blues in here. And see the magentas and the purples? They are now my shadowy, cooler areas. Much cooler here, uh, more towards the blue, because it's, it's darker and it's really hidden behind. Um, the uh, the grasses and here it's a little warmer um, so this one was a cooler purple and where's that other one and this one was um, a magenta more closer to warmer because of the sunlight okay I hope I'm making sense <laughs> I might throw in a few of these magentas here oh yeah because these are peeking out a little bit more into the sunlight but see so far I have not used the typical um, colors of marsh grasses, which would be greens and oranges and yellows. I'm using um, punched up color. Just a little bit of that back there to indicate that water meandering around. I think I need a little darker in here in some places. You notice this value, it's darker. I've added it for some of the grasses, but where it comes to the, the deep parts of those grasses, the darkest here, because they're close, they're not gonna be as dark back there. That's why I'm using more of a, a medium to dark value back here to indicate that. All right. And you know, it's kind of like I was saying before, sometimes it's just a mood it's a feeling and I'm finding myself not needing to add a lot of the like I said the typical colors of some of these grasses when the Sun would shine on it because I have that warm underpainting glowing through this you know it would almost be kind of pointless to add too much of that color back again it's it's doing its job just as an underpainting <laughs> and I really do like it when it peeks through like that so something else that I've learned too is um, to start slowing down when you get to this point and you don't want to overwork this. There's a tendency to just fill up that tooth and get too carried away um, when that would be, oh, just so terrible to mess up a painting you'd work so hard on. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm going to work on this a little bit more and uh, add my comments as I go. I cover up a little bit of that pink there. It was a little strong.
Now I'm going to paint for a little while and um, maybe add a little bit more commentary, but I wanted to make a point here that um, you can see that other than the complementary color for the background, I've used mostly what we learned from the color wheel is um, an analogous color scheme, okay, using shades or tints or colors that lie adjacent to each other. And you can see that um, most of what I've used, I'm going to arrange my palette down here too so you can see it um, after I'm done, is um, more of the this, this range. You see I've got the magentas, I've got the purples, blue violets, blue greens, and uh, the most um, warm color that I have is uh, some of the greens and the grasses, and I even have a a um, not too light of a value of a green okay it's gonna be it's a warmer green like right in here and then of course the only other uh, complementary um, uh, warm color that I have would be the underpainting itself which is uh, more in this orange yellow orange which gives the glow so uh, so definitely this was more of an, an, an analogous color uh, scheme palette uh, which I like and um, I didn't necessarily plan it that way, but that just felt right. And I think it probably comes from um, just looking at a lot of art and painting for a few years now, quite a few years now, and uh, feeling that those colors just feel harmonious and, uh, and um, work well together. <laughs>